Our next talk is by Nick Schneider on Maven's Imaging Ultraviolet Spectrograph, a theme, and the legacy of Charles Barth, another theme. Uh, by the end of the day, we already have uh, some traditions among us, and one of them is to linger on the first slide. Um, and so uh, what I'll say is there are many things already which are the legacy of Charles Barth. Um, and I consider LASP's ability to propose, uh, to win, and build, launch, and operate Maven as to be uh, part of his tremendous legacy. Uh, I think that I am also <laughs> part of his legacy. When I gave uh, my job talk about 25 years ago, he sat about there. And every time uh, I made a point, he went like this. <laughs> when I made another point, he went like this. And I said, I'm getting through. I'm getting across here. This is really going well. And everything just became crystal clear, and I got the job. Uh, and later I learned that he does this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, the day had been won. Uh, uh, and here I am. Uh, so I'd like to um, point out uh, two remarkable people who also carry the uh, legacy of uh, Charles Barth. Is Bill McClintock in the room? Because everything in LASP has ever done right for ultraviolet spectrographs, uh, he has embodied and installed into uh, the Maven IEVS. Ian Stewart, uh, in the back of the room there, of course, was along for LASP's first ride to Mars. Uh, on the Mariner missions and has had burning questions in his mind for decades, which now we're in a position uh, to answer. And it's uh, a privilege to be working with the two of them. We have a very uh, uh, large team of hardworking people. Uh, in fact, I think they're upstairs working hard right now. Um, and uh, we're getting some remarkable results of which I can give you just a few highlights. Ending mystery. What happened to the atmosphere of Mars? Billions of years ago, Mars had a substantial atmosphere that blanketed the planet, keeping Mars warm and sustaining liquid water on its surface. Today, only a wispy shroud of CO2 remains, and the planet below is colder and drier than any desert on Earth. So I think you knew that, right? But I had to show it anyway uh, for the purpose of MAVEN um, uh, uh, shown here. Uh, this is not a small satellite with small instruments on it. This is going to Mars and really doing it right based on the questions we learned to pose uh, from past missions. Uh, by the way, this is managed by Goddard, not by Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, and so our instrument is uh, down here on uh, the, uh, the articulated payload platform. You're going to hear about a number of things that uh, our instrument, the Imaging Ultraviolet Spectrograph, had to do in a more sophisticated manner because uh, several ultraviolet spectrographs have been to Mars already. Uh, and so um, uh, we had to implement those uh, to go farther. Uh, and so uh, it's got two channels for um, optimization and independent wavelength ranges. Um, and it's got a number of different operating modes, and uh, we've actually learned, in effect, that we have five instruments operating, uh, learning uh, about Mars in five different ways, and so it's a really uh, uh, remarkable instrument. Uh, this is uh, the instrument uh, from the proposal, uh, where it's sort of still in uh, CAD or PowerPoint level, and the predicted spectrum of what we would see, and all of the familiar emissions from atoms and molecules in the atmosphere of Mars. And the, one of the uh, first remarkable things we've done in this instrument uh, is to allow a grating to flip in and out of the beam, which allows us to work in the low resolution modes that capture the whole wavelength ranges of the far ultraviolet and the mid ultraviolet. Um, uh, we've uh, flipped that grating and we're able to split the Lyman alpha line into its two components from hydrogen and deuterium. Uh, never been done at another planet uh, and uh, we're doing it right now. Uh, this group seems to like uh, optical layouts of spectrographs uh, and so uh, there you have it. Um, uh, this is not an Ebert fasting uh, and uh, the shell design uh, sent us uh, over the edge to use a, a Cherney Turner design. As I said, this is not a small instrument, and so uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not a light instrument, but it's really capable of doing things right. Uh, as I um, show you on the diagram here, it's got the ability to look in two different directions um, and anywhere within these fields of regard using a scan mirror, and we, that's enabled some pretty remarkable results. Uh, so uh, we were very proud of this figure. It shows the actual data taken on the right compared to the data in the or the simulated data in the proposal, and so it really works. I have to take this off uh, quickly for this group. The differences between these two diagrams are due primarily to calibration. 
so uh, what I wanted to do though, um, if I can get this going again, hmm, seem to be a little hung here. Uh, escape and try. Uh, Frank, I think I'll let you uh, try that. Um, okay. <laughs> there's nothing fancy about that slide. So uh, the, not only does the spectrum look like the simulation, uh, what I'm going to show you on the uh, next slide is that the spectrum actually looks uh, almost exactly like the Mariner spectra, which are more than uh, 40 years old. Are we getting that uh, back yet? Okay, that looks good. So if we can go back uh, to that very slide. Uh, and so here are the two data sets overlaid. Uh, you can say that Mars hasn't changed very much. We're sending up two instruments with different calibrations uh, and uh, seeing uh, pretty much exactly the same spectral features uh, that Barth uh, first saw uh, back uh, late 60s, early 70s. And, uh, believe me, we did a lot more with this instrument than just make our lines a little bit narrower than the uh, uh, Mariner spectrograph. One of the things that we are capable of doing uh, by having spatial resolution along the slit and by moving the uh, uh, slit with the scan mirror is the ability to uh, construct two-dimensional images. This is one of our first releases. And these are the first images of the atomic exospheres of Mars. And you can see uh, especially our ability to, well, certainly the ability to distinguish carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen here. But this is really important uh, for understanding what happened to Mars because its atmospheric gases, the carbon dioxide and the water vapor, disappear in atomic form. And by uh, studying the vertical distribution of these and the response to solar inputs, we're going to be able to figure out if Mars could have lost an ocean's worth of water and 99% of its atmosphere, which it uh, must have had earlier, to maintain a sufficient greenhouse effect. Uh, we're also able to map ozone on the planet, and uh, the physics of ozone is completely different there than it is on the Earth. Um, uh, and yet we have the same capability to study it um, in the Hartley bands. So uh, there are many things that we went to Mars that had been seen to study that have been seen before that we'll do better on. Uh, but we also saw a handful of surprises, and uh, this was one of them. Um, let me see if I can uh, start the movie up here. Uh, and this uh, lets you ride along with the MAVEN spacecraft and the, our moving slit in one of our fields of regard here doing limb scans. Uh, those of you capable of doing instant spectroscopy, what do you see? What do you see? <laughs> Paul, I'm counting on you here. Uh, so we're seeing the Cameron bands that we've heard about uh, before, the uh, CO2 ultraviolet doublet, and a booming line uh, that shows up right about there, if I can hold my cursor steady enough. So uh, this is what we were looking at. This is the uh, atmosphere just before the arrival, uh, the close passage of Comet Siding Spring. These are all the features I showed you before, the same ones uh, Barth saw. What do we see right after the Comet Passage? This booming line, the brightest line in the whole spectrum from magnesium, ionized magnesium. Now if you hadn't heard um, Amy's talk a minute ago, you wouldn't even think of magnesium as an atmospheric ingredient, and you shouldn't. Um, but here it is in the atmosphere of Mars, a result of the incredible meteor shower that must have happened there. And this is what you would have seen with ultraviolet eyes, had you been looking uh, at that time. Incredible glow um, from uh, the ablation of meteors there. Nothing like this has happened on Earth uh, in recorded, uh, in recent history. The 1833 meteor shower of the Leonids is probably the closest thing, with thousands or, ten, or tens of thousands uh, of meteors per hour. Another great surprise that we saw was on the night side, um, and we saw the glow of ultraviolet aurora. Now, aurora have already been detected on Mars in the southern hemisphere associated with magnetic fields. Everybody ex expects aurora next to magnetic fields, um, controlled by magnetic fields, but these are solar energetic particles arriving um, uh, from the sun along draped magnetic field lines. Uh, <coughs> big surprise. So the last thing I wanted to do is to leave you with a new image that we haven't shown um, outside the team. Um, and we're OK with this, right, Bruce? Um, it is, I confess, an image only a, an instrumenter could really love. It's kind of full of artifacts and, and uh, things that I will explain away. This is Mars uh, seen from the night side. And in fact, 
Uh, for most of this, Maven is an eclipse behind the planet. And there's just this wisp of a crescent around the edge uh, down here. This is the center of the night side indicated by these contours of solar zenith angle. And there are a couple of surprises that we saw on the other side that is tens of degrees away from the terminator. And uh, one of the first of them uh, is, uh, the, uh, is uh, a polar cloud. And this is probably, um, this could be a polar hood, this could be dust, we're not sure what it is. But it is so far into the night side that it's going to be a bit of a radiator transfer problem to see how that can possibly be getting there. We'll move on. <laughs> no analysis allowed, Paul. It's, it's a pretty picture. Um, uh, uh, this is a uh, solar continuum that we're looking at here. Um, and the last ingredient in this picture, a suitable tribute uh, to Charles Barth, is nitric oxide. Never imaged at Mars before, um, but hanging around the North Pole, and uh, nitric oxide forming from the recombination of nitrogen and oxygen uh, freed of their molecular bonds on the day side and recombining on the night side and giving off these photons. So to be here at Mars, um, building on the legacy of Charles Barth through the study of Cameron bands and all the, the emissions that were discovered by um, mariners 40 years ago and to be completing the picture by detecting nitric oxide in this first image here. Uh, uh, it's, it's something that could only have happened out of last, but thanks to the legacy of Charles Barth. Thank you. Questions? Do you need any more wavelengths, Paul? <laughs> you didn't see any water from the time ago. You didn't see any OH. Uh, so far, uh, we haven't detected I mean, any you other... you particulate matter. You, the comet passed too far away from Mars to get any gas from the... There were tons and tons of gas deposited on the atmosphere. Sadly, much of the cometary material is the same stuff that you'd find at Mars. Um, uh, so we haven't yet seen any effect apart from meteor ablation um, and the ions that formed that depth. Is it too early to talk about the deuterium to hydrogen ratio? Um, it's uh, too early to talk about results about deuterium to hydrogen. If I'd had another minute, my next slide would have been to show you the bump of deuterium, which we can detect in a matter of minutes. Um, as, as most people in this room know, seeing the optically thin deuterium line adjacent to the optically thick hydrogen line is only the start of your efforts. Um, so we have a long way to go with radiator, way to go. With radiator transfer, but the detection is there and it's looking good. Okay, thank you again.